Welcome back to the class Computational Neuroscience, Neural Dynamics of Cognition. This will be the final part of our discussion of synaptic plasticity and learning. When I introduced synaptic plasticity at the beginning of this week's series, I had several tasks in mind. One of these was receptive field formation. We have covered this one. And the other one was memory, storing memories. Now, an important concept here is the concept of the Hepian assembly that we have seen before. The question now is, can I, can I really use these synaptic learning rules to store Hepian assemblies, and not just one, but several ones? So suppose I come back from a trip to a foreign country where I've seen interesting fruit. I've seen a banana, I've seen an apple, and I have formed memories. I formed assemblies that consist of strongly connected neurons. And now if I come back to my home country, and if I assume that now all the weights are fixed, so if learning is turned off, I just have the strong weights, then I can retrieve my memories. Suppose we have a big memory of about a few thousand cells, and one of the assemblies, say the Apple assembly, corresponds to 400 neurons that have strong connections to each other. And just to make things simple for us, I've put all these 400 cells in this lower left corner, so you see these strong connections as this part of the matrix. Now use this matrix of connection weights in a network of spiking neurons, 4,000 neurons, and this network has a spontaneously active state, it's the background state, and then I give a stimulus, I look at a photo of the exotic fruit, and suddenly my memories are revived. And this subset of 400 cells down here fires strongly. So we can analyze this network using tools from mean field theory, tools from large populations of neurons, and the red curve here is the FI curve, of my cells. And then I will see that there are two crossing points with the diagonal, and this point here corresponds to a high activity state. That's the state of the neurons when the assembly is recalled, when the memory is recalled. And then there's another fixed point, another crossing point that corresponds to activity in the background of the network. So, with this fixed weights with this fixed assembly stored in the network, we can retrieve the memories. However, this changes completely if we say, even when I'm back from my trip, the learning rule is still active. So why should plasticity stop afterwards? I still want to learn if, even if I'm back. So if I now use one of these combined LTP and LTD rules, for example, an STB triplet rule, the one we have discussed before, then I will see, yes, I can recall the stimulus, but after a few seconds already, the total network activity blows completely up. So the network goes into a super high activity state, an epileptic state, which is functionally completely useless. And the reason is that neurons that are in this high activity state the state I discussed before, will have a high rate, and that means a neuron that's connected to a neuron inside the assembly will see a link, will find a postsynaptic neuron that's high, firing at a high rate, but it, the presynaptic neuron also fires at a low rate. Therefore, these neurons here, at a high synaptic rate, will be in the part of the BCM window down here where the weight change is positive. And therefore, neurons that have a link into the assembly will have weights that grow and grow and grow. And you see this here. This was my original matrix, but presynaptic cells outside, like the cell here, will make a connection into the assembly with a strong weight. And as a result of this, within a short time, the activity explodes. In other words, we have a problem 
with online plasticity during memory retrieval. So the situation now is, for a modeler, for a theoretician, we want memory formation, we want memory retention, but we also want network stability and the whole thing with spike in neurons. So we need to combine synaptic plasticity rules with behavioral consequences and formulate learning algorithms that are in the end stable and fulfill the functions we want. How can we do this? Well, let's go back for a moment to the rate picture. We had this expansion, okay? but the expansion doesn't stop here. The expansion can go on and we can have additional terms like this term here, pre postsynaptic squared. Well, that's a term that we recognize. This is one of the BCN terms that would be the term that increases, that leads to LTP of the synaptic weights. In fact, if you combine this term with that term, and that's a negative sign, then we, are, we have exactly the BCM rule. Now what's new here is that we also have a term that has the postsynaptic activity to the fourth power. What that means is that if there are short bursts of postsynaptic spikes, then this term will contribute. So if this weight is negative, then any high activity state, like the problematic epileptic state that we had seen before, will cause a decrease in the weights. Now just for terminology, the Hepian type terms are called homosynaptic. It's only the synapse J that changes by a combination of activity at the presynaptic neuron J and activity at the postsynaptic neuron I. So this is synapse specific, pre and post together. But then there are other terms that are driven just by postsynaptic activity. These lead to heterosynaptic plasticity. It's not only this synapse which is changed, but there are also other synapses which are changed at the same time. Therefore, it's called heterosynaptic plasticity, and these would be all terms that just depend on the postsynaptic neuron. And then you can also have the term that just depends on the presynaptic activity. And we would call this a transmitter-induced term. So let's have a look at this term. So in this case, a strong stimulus was given to the postsynaptic neuron, such that the postsynaptic neuron emitted a burst of spikes. No presynaptic stimulation was given at all. And without this brief synaptic stimulation, there is still a change of these synapses. And some synapses go down, others don't change, and some synapses even go up. So if we formulate a heterosynaptic term that has the postsynaptic activity to the fourth power, and with a factor here that depends on Wij, then this model can account for all these different possibilities. So let me sum this up. We have this term, and for a weight that's larger than a reference, I have a negative sign. For a weight that's smaller than a reference, I have a positive sign. And then I have these terms here, that would be the normal Hepian term for potentiation and depression, as in the BCM model. It's also useful to keep this presynaptic only term, the transmitter induced contribution. Now with this setup, the total weight change that's plotted here has an offset. So if there is presynaptic activity, that's what we assume throughout, then there's a weight change, even in the absence of postsynaptic activity. If I have pre and post together, then first I get a negative contribution, but then it bends over quadratically with the postsynaptic activity, which is this axis here. 
But if the postsynaptic activity is really high, then the postsynaptic fourth order term kicks in, which makes the curve bend down again. And now this means, if you come back to the previous graph, that neurons in the assembly that fire at high activity no longer change their weights. The weight change for these neurons is zero. It also means that synapses that go from outside the assembly into the assembly will see a postsynaptic neuron that fires at a rate where this term is exactly zero. So we expect from the analysis of this model that the network now is much more stable than it was before. Now all of this can be implemented with spiking neurons. I gave you a formulation with a fine rate model for plasticity, but in fact it's implemented with synaptic traces triggered by spikes. I have a network of excitatory neurons. Each neuron gets input from a subset of receptive cells. So this would be roughly the receptive field size of this neuron characterized here. These are excitatory neurons. They are connected to inhibitory neurons that send inhibitory input back to these neurons. Now these connections here between the excitatory neurons are subject to the plasticity rule I just discussed. The feedforward connections are also subject to the plasticity rule I just discussed. Before learning start, the network is in a state of asynchronous firing. Now we present different stimuli. For example, the red stimulus, which really is a circle, the blue stimulus, which would be a square across a triangle. While the triangle is presented, a subset of these neurons in the network show activity. While the cross is presented, a subset shows activity. And this is at the beginning of learning. At the beginning of learning, neurons here are driven by the inputs. As soon as the input stops, the activity goes down to the stochastic firing state. But now learning continues. Different stimuli are presented one after the other again and again. And after roughly two hours, we now have an interesting effect. It's sufficient now to present the stimulus, such as the square, for just a very short time, just for this moment here. The assembly is triggered and the assembly shows activity that's prolonged. So this corresponds to working memory. I can just have a brief look at the photograph of the exotic fruit and then I will remember the taste and the color and the shape. I can imagine in my mind what it was like to have this fruit in my hands. If I give a triangle stimulus just for a very short time, it's a different subset of neurons which is activated. So these acti activity lines here correspond to summing up the activities that respond in this assembly. But the assembly is not predefined. The assembly has been learned with the plasticity rule. Now what's important, the plasticity rule is never turned off. We have ongoing plasticity, we have ongoing activity, and the network as a whole is indeed stable. I started off this week with a long list of things that we would like to have. Synaptic plasticity should enable learning in the sense of adapting the brain to the statistics of the task. It should develop receptive fields, allocate more space. It should memorize facts. It should maybe learn a motor task. At the same time, we have to avoid the blow up of activity or unnecessary use of energy. We covered a lot of ground. The models are presented do a lot of these things. They are able to develop receptive fields. We can use them to form and store and retrieve memories. Yet I have the feeling I've just scratched the surface. Plasticity is a big topic in itself and would deserve a full series of lectures. However, what I wanted to show is that the network models of cognition that we discussed in this series of lectures can be linked to synaptic plasticity. 
Thanks for staying with me until the end. And I hope you liked it.